All right, all right. Good morning, Green Valley. Who's happy to be in church today? Yeah, yeah. Hey, today, um, and I'm just going to start up front. Visitors, if you're a guest here and you've been invited by somebody, you don't have to participate in what we're going to do next. But this is what I ask from the Green Valley crowd. And if you want to participate of your guests, great. But it's a crowd participation thing. So first of all, I have to have you trust me. By cheer and clap, how many are going to trust me today? How many are going to trust me? Hey, only half of the 9 o'clock crowd trusted me. But here's what I need you to do, and it's to make a point, okay? So I need you, okay, listen, I need you to trust me. Pull out your wallet, money clip, or ATM card. Pull it out, out of your purse, wallet, pocket, whatever you got right now. Pull it out right here. I got mine. I got it out right here. Okay, some of you are already getting nervous, and if you're a guest or visitor, feel no obligation to participate. <laughs> okay? Now I just want you to hold it up like this right here, like this, okay? How many are semi-uncomfortable with what's going to happen next? Anybody? <laughs> Okay, here's what I want you to do. you got to trust me. Stay with it. The 9 o'clock crowd actually did. I need you, preferably to not with somebody that you came with, exchange yours with theirs, all right? <laughs> exchange it with yours or theirs, all right? Here we go. Here we go. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, yeah, all right, all right, here we go. Okay. Okay, now everybody, hold it out like this. Hold it out like this. Okay, now we're going to take an offering, and I want you to give like you've never given before, all right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, let me, let me just, let's just be honest. How many of this is a little uncomfortable? Just raise your hand if it's a little uncomfortable, all right? Yeah, 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 it is, huh? Here, let's give you exchange of back so we can all breathe, all right? Because some of you haven't bre- took a breath for a while. <laughs> Somebody, whoo, I got that over with. Here's the thing, we're uncomfortable with this because this is something that really our, our lives tend to revolve around. And we as a people and as a culture, we really have a hang up with money. We really do, if you think about it. Now don't get me wrong, money has a huge upside, huge upside. It can be used to provide for the basic needs of our lives, like food, shelter, clothing, transportation. It can be uh, used to help an organization like World Vision to help the Ukrainian refugees who've lost everything in the midst of a war. It has a huge upside because it can be used to help uh, research cancer and other diseases and find a cure for those things. It has a huge upside upside because it can even be used to enhance your date and, or your, your marriage and bring joy to it, like buying two U2 tickets and go to the concert, like I would love that to happen for me. <laughs> it has a huge upside, but it also has a really, really down dark side. I mean, if you think about it, it can f- inflict endless hours of worry and anxiety and stress. It has the potential to make us prideful, selfish, greedy. It can make us into liars, thieves, and addicts. It can destroy friendships, business partnerships, and even marriage. You know, I think I've shared this from the platform that the first two years of Kelly and I's marriage, the thing that we fought over above everything else was money. And if we didn't get a handle on that issue, it could have derailed our now 35-year marriage. What? Well, yeah, I mean, you, uh, it's great. We made it. <laughs> That's all I can say. But my friends, this is why Jesus talked about money more than he talked about heaven or hell. Matter of fact, of the 29 parables that Christ told, which are just stories, spiritual stories to help us understand who Jesus is and what he's about, 16 of them deal with a person and his relationship with money and possessions. Nearly 25% of Jesus' words, the red letters in your Bible, in the New Testament, deal with the proper role of money in our lives. Now, why would Jesus talk so much about this one issue? And here's the reason why. Because money has the greatest potential to replace God in your life. And this is why Jesus taught on it. It's why it's so important for us to talk about it today, because I think many people, when it comes to this issue, are very confused about the God and money relationship. 
you know, does what the Bible teach about money, is it something that I'm supposed to give it all away and I'm not supposed to have any? Am I not supposed to have possessions or have nice things? I mean, and if I don't have money, should I be ashamed of that fact? You know, what does the Bible actually say about these things? But reason that Jesus taught on money so, uh, so much was we get hung up on money. We get it so it becomes the center of our lives and has the potential to become all that we think about. It consumes our thoughts. And what Jesus wanted to do with his teaching is set us free from the control, the stress, the anxiety about money when we have it in its wrong place in our lives. So here's what I want to do today. I just want to talk about two questions that we need to answer in order to keep money in its proper perspective. But before we get started, I want to address a few things. First of all, if you are someone that was invited by a friend today and this is your first day, you were not set up, okay? I didn't tell, they don't know what I was going to speak about today. We're going through the Gospel of Mark, and we're looking about who Jesus is, and this actually just falls in line with the, the story of Jesus' life in Mark chapter 10. So that's where we're at today, Mark chapter 10. So I just want you to know you are not set up. And, and, and think about this, if you're not even a Christ follower, it's great, because you don't have to even listen to this if you don't want to, um, but your friends do, who brought you, all right? Many of us are confused about the relationship with God and money because of the abuse of many so-called spiritual leaders who have used scripture to manipulate people out of their money. And I just want to say I'm sorry for that. Because in a way, these people, when they speak, they kind of represent the whole church, but they don't. And so what we're going to try to do is try to get an honest look of God's perspective, not something that Scott wants or Green Valley Church wants. Third, some of us, when we hear messages like this and we're in a difficult financial time, maybe we've lost a job or maybe we've had huge medical bills or maybe we're just scrimping by, we kind of feel a sense of shame and guilt in these moments because we're talking about money and because we don't have any, there's this shame that comes over us. Let me tell you something. Shame is not a tool of God. Guilt is not a tool of God. It's not. Okay? So I just want you to relax. Be free because God's teachings are to set us free from shame or guilt, not to bring it on us. Last but not least, I'm not your boss. I'm not in charge of you. I don't have any authority over you, but I'm going to do my best to persuade you to examine what you hear today and apply it to your life in this God and money relationship. Now, the story we're going to talk about today is actually a story that is probably close to, if not my favorite story in the Bible for a number of reasons, but it deals in reality, and the outcome is not a great outcome. It's not one where it's all nice and tight and everybody's happy and they walk off into the sunset and life is good, but it's an actual encounter that Jesus had with a young man. Now, I'm just going to read the story for and we'll break it down. It says, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus' response is really interesting in this, in this moment because he responds with a question. He says, why do you call me good? Jesus asked, only God is truly good. Now let me just pause there and kind of give you the backstory of what's happening here. Um, the Jewish people only believed that good could be applied to God. So when he calls, he comes up to Jesus and he says, you know, you are truly a good person, a good man. He's actually, in his mind, has come to a place where he thinks this is the Messiah, this is God because of Jesus' reputation and all that he is, he's done in there. He thinks, okay, this might be God in his life. And so Jesus asks him that question because Jesus knows that he doesn't really know what he's in for. Jesus is going to ask him something that if he truly is God to this man, then only God would ask this, and if you're going to say no to God, then, man, we got to get to the brass tacks is what's really going on in your life. So Jesus moves on from the question, and he says this. But to answer your question, he says, you know the commandments, you must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not uh, testify falsely, you must not cheat anyone, honor your father and mother. And the rich young ruler just chimes off really fast, he goes, 
uh, teacher, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. And you can almost hear the excitement in his voice that, hey, I've done all the right things to become a Christ follower. I've done all the things that are, are right. But Jesus knows what's really in this guy's heart. He thinks he knows God, but he doesn't understand what it means to follow him. So looking at the man, the Bible says, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Now I want to just pause right there and do a little side thing. And I want everybody to hear this, whether you're a Christ follower or not. No matter where you're at in life, no matter what you believe about God, no matter how many bad things or how many stuff that's going on in your life that you're ashamed of, Jesus will always look at you with love. Genuine love. And even in this moment when Jesus knows this guy doesn't really understand what's going on, he looks at him with love because he's one of his creations. And what he's about to do next is he's about to get to the core issue of this guy's life that's keeping him from being a follower of his. He says, there's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Now, let me just say a few things about this. This is the only time in Scripture where Jesus looks at one person and says, sell all your possessions and follow me. It's the only time. So why does Jesus hit him right there? It's because he was hung up on money. You see, he'd been killing nine out of the ten commandments. I mean, he's a good guy. But he forgot about the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before you. And the reason why Jesus is hitting this is that because money was out of place in his life, it had now become the God and the God that he was seeking was asking him to remove it. But he was so hung up, he couldn't make the right answer. Now, I want you just to think about this before we go. he went on. His hang-up with money kept him from becoming a follower of Jesus. Now, the weight of that should make us all rise up to attention. Because behind this story, there's two questions that have to be answered in our personal life in order to get money and God relationship in its proper order. And I'm just going to hit these two today. And I want you to think about this as we go through it. The first question that we have to answer is, yours or mine? Yours or mine? You see, the tension that we feel with money and possessions when it comes to our God-money relationship is how we view ourselves in light of our money and possession. The first way that we view ourselves could be it's mine. I believe that everything I have is mine. I own it. I worked for it. It's mine. The other way that we can view our money and possessions is it's God's. I understand that everything that I have been given has been given to me by, by God, and I'm just a mere caretaker of that. Because here's the problem. The problem we is we live in a culture that screams, whatever I have, I'm entitled to. I earned it. I worked for it. I created it. I designed it. I owned it. So it's mine to do with it as I please. And this is not just in our culture. This is actually ingrained in our sin nature. And we see this come out in childhood. Think about Right now, you know, uh, my, my son-in-law and my daughter are teaching my grandbaby words and what to say. And so, you know, the first words that mom and dad want their baby to say is, you know, mommy or daddy. You know, they, they teach mommy or daddy. And so there's maybe this little competition that goes into mommy and daddy. Now, I never got into that at my house, even though both of my girls said daddy first. I've never brought that up. <laughs> But those are kind of the first words that happen, right? Mommy or daddy. Then the next word that a kid learns is what? No. Yeah. Right? No. 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 Everything is no for a while. But then right on the cups of no, the next word they learn is mine. Yeah. It's mine. It's my toys. It's my stuff. It's my food. It's mine. 
And here's the problem. The problem is this. Some of us go to our graves, and that's still our favorite word. Now, we might not say it out loud, but it's everywhere. It's on our wallet, our checkbook. It's on our house, our car, our time. It's mine. Now, the rich young ruler, when he's asked by Jesus, hey, I want you to sell all your possessions, and I want you to give them away, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. He was so hung up with the stuff that he had that was his, he couldn't release it to become a follower of Christ. You see, it's really interesting. His gods, or his God, I should say, is out of order. You know, um, Augustine of Hippo describes a principle called Ordo Amoris, which is Latin for the order of love. And what Augustine described was that the only way to experience the right relationship with God is to have our loves in the right order, God being number one. And Augustine goes on to describe the human emptiness as having our love in disorder. The reason why we're empty and feel like something's missing is because our love is out of order. And he says that if your your loves are in the wrong order, there will always be something missing until God is on top. Now I want you to think about this for just a moment. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus, he knew there was something missing. He asked him, what should I do to inherit eternal life? He knew that he didn't have the answer to it. So he knew there was something missing. So he comes to him, but he can't follow him because his love was out of order. He loved money, his stuff, more than he loved God. Now, Jesus said these words. So if you get mad at me, get mad at Jesus, all right? It says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, that's a really interesting way that Jesus ends that little paragraph right there. Why does he say God and money? I mean, you could have picked a whole lot of other things, right? You could have said, no, uh, no one can serve God in pride. No one can serve God in pleasure. No one can serve God in selfishness. No, he specifically says money. Why? It's because every one of us, even Christ followers, have the potential of allowing money to become their primary pursuit or concern, which will ultimately make it their master, their Lord, their God. See, the only way to keep money from being your master in life is if you purposely, intentionally prioritize something else above it. And Jesus gave us the proper order. He said, seek the kingdom of God above all else. You know what above all else is interpreted in the Greek language? Above all else. I mean, it's very clear. And live righteously. What is righteous living? Do you have to live perfectly? No. Righteous living is this. It's following a pattern of Jesus' life. Looking at the life of Christ and living to the best of my ability to follow and do what Jesus did. That's a righteous life. He says, this is the order. Seek first the kingdom of God. And then there's a promise that comes with this order. The order is, and he will give you everything you need. You know, all the things that you worry about, all the things that you need, all the things that need to be paid for, all the things that you need to survive, all the things that you're concerned about, all those things are going to get done if you get the order right. So you have to keep it in order. And let me just tell you, There is incredible, incredible freedom when you get this question answered the right way. You see, when you have a mindset of it's mine, there's this burden now to try to hang on to it, guard it, store it, 
you got concerns and worry over it. It consumes your thoughts. It robs your sleep at night. How many have ever been worried about money and it's robbed you of one night's sleep? Raise your hand right now. Yeah, it, you, you're just consumed with it, right? And some of you and me, we sometimes get into this place that this is what we're pursuing. Some of you look into the stock market when it opens and when it closes before you go to bed. Why? Because you're pursuing money. Now, I'm not saying you're not supposed to be a good steward of your money. The Bible tells us to do that. But it becomes an obsession. We're checking our bank account and how big it is. We're checking our retirement to see if it's going in the right direction. We're trying to make sure all the bills are being paid. And here's the other side of the coin. The other side of the coin that people are on is they don't have enough of it. So they think to themselves, I've got to get more of it. Everything that I do, all of my time has to be spent on getting more of it. What's going on? You're pursuing the wrong order. And this is the the burden of this mindset of it's mine. You have to worry about it, clean it, take care of it. And it constantly, I mean, some of us have things, possessions, that we don't even use because we're afraid it's going to get dented, tarnished, or something's going to happen to it. I would ask you, why do you have it in the first place? But when you have the mindset of it's yours, there's this beautiful mindset that takes place. It's mine to take care of. But it's also mine to enjoy of, enjoy, to bring purpose to. It's mine to have, you know, fun with. It's mine to share it with. But the thing is, it's not my ultimate responsibility. So if something happens to it or it's taken away or something, you know, goes wrong, then ultimately it's not my responsibility because it was God's all the time. Now, if you're not following me, let me give you a great illustration. Um, you, know, you know that I've had a, a grandbaby, and it's really, really fun. And this is my grandbaby up here. Uh, this is Isla, little Isla. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> That's my daughter. And I mean, this kid is absolutely precious. And I got to tell you, when she's having fun and she's laughing and stuff, it's a wonderful thing, man. And I get to enjoy her and hug her and kiss her. But man, if she has a dirty diaper, she got a bad attitude, it goes back to mom and dad, man. Because it's not my ultimate responsibility. And this is kind of, maybe not the best illustration, but this is kind of the same way that God wants us to view the stuff that he's granted us and given us. Is that it's really not ours in the first place. And if we would just get the order right, we'd probably enjoy our stuff more Or we would probably worry less about not having enough. So here's my challenge, okay? This is going to be practical for you. And and again, I want you to participate. I'm not going to make you uncomfortable like the last one. But uh, would you just take your hands out like this and make two fists? Would you just do this? Because this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to do this every morning, okay? Every morning. Your two fists clenched represent Everything that you have, all the stuff that you have or don't have, everything that you're hanging on to, it represents that. That's what the two fins clench. And just for a moment in the morning, get up in the morning, squeeze these fists together. This represents all that I have, God. And then what I want you to do is I just want you to do this. Go like this. God, I let it go. I let it go. It's all yours. Help me to take care of it, enjoy it, be a good steward of it, but ultimately it's yours, and I give it away. You watch how you worry less. When you re- realize that it's God's and it's not yours. Get the order right. Okay, second question we've got to answer is this. Give or withhold? Now, this is a practical thing that we see right here in the passage that Jesus asked the rich young ruler to do. A very practical thing. He says, I want you to sell all your possessions and give it to the way of the poor. Now, here's a little insight that Tim Fulton gave me. I thought it was really cool. Jesus doesn't say, I want you to give away all your income. He realizes this guy's got to live. He said, I want you to give all away your possessions. Why? Because the possessions had become the blocking point. He says, I want you to get all that away. I want you to do a practical step, an outward manifestation that I'm Lord of your life. Now, when we look at this ask of Jesus, he's asking a lot. I mean, think about right now, if God asked you that, I want you to give away all your possessions. Think about how you would have to wrestle with that. I mean, that's a big, big ask. 
you know, he's probably thinking, well, maybe I got family got to take care of. And, you know, they love this part of this possession. They love the house and all this stuff. Maybe he's thinking through that stuff. Maybe he's thinking maybe this ask is a little unreasonable. I mean, because I got a lot of stuff, God. You, you don't really understand. And God's going, I own it all, but you know, maybe he's thinking about Zacchaeus. He heard about Zacchaeus' transformation. Well, Zacchaeus only gave back half his stuff. How come I don't have to give half? What Jesus is doing is he's getting down to the root of the rich young ruler's issue. Because to follow Christ means you're going to have to trust Christ. Not your stuff. You see, it's interesting about us as human beings is we can trust God with all kinds of stuff. We trust him with our salvation. We trust him with our sorrows. We trust him with our sanctification. But when it gets to this, we have a hard time trusting God. You know, I love our dollar bill because of what it says on the back here. It says, in God we trust. Really? Because honestly, it probably should say if we're being real, in the dollar bill we trust. And the, here's the problem. The problem is, is we live in a culture that says this, and this is why it's so hard for us to give, that if I give to someone else, that means there's going to be less for me. That's the culture that we live in. If I give to someone else, then I will have less. We see this played out in all kinds of areas of our life. Let me give you an example. Let me, let me show you a little thing of fries up here, all right? These are in and out fries. These have been created by God himself for mankind. <laughs> <laughs> and when you go to In-N-Out Burger, you get your meal, and if you want fries, you order fries. But your spouse, wife, or husband says, well, I don't want fries, I just want a sandwich. But then we sit down at the table, and the fries are on the table, and your spouse, who should order fries, wants fries, and they say, can I have a few fries? And you think in your mind, you should have ordered your own fries. And don't tell me you're not counting how many fries they eat. I know I've been there. I have been there. It's because if we, we have a culture that says if I give, there's going to be less for me. See, here's the priorities in which we live our lives in this culture, especially the American culture. We live our lives this way. We, we live it with um, uh, living first. I think that's slide. Live first. In other words, whatever we make, we live on. We go and do stuff, we play, we pay bills, and, we go, and that's, all of that really is okay. And then what we do is we save a little bit, and then we give whatever's left over. Oh, I got an extra 20, here you go, God. God bless you. But actually, what the Bible says is this. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and your first fruits from all crops. In other words, God wants us to flip the script on how we live, and that is to give, save, then live. And the principles behind that are, you know, a lot of people give 10%, they save 10%, and they live on the 80, and they enjoy it, and they do, they pay the bills, they have fun, they go to Tahoe, whatever the case is. But this is the reality of what God is asking us to do. And why? Why is he asking us to live this way? Because when you give first, you dethrone money as God of your life. It's a beautiful thing. Now, this isn't just something that Jesus says, okay, all you people do it. This is the something he gave us as an example. It's right in the John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. First. Matter of fact, Paul puts it like this. He says, while we were yet sinners, Christ gave his life for us. Before we even liked him, before we even knew about it, he gave his life. He set the standard. He gave first. Jesus said when he came to this earth, I've come to serve, not to be served. Jesus set the standard for all this stuff. So what he's asking his followers to do is stuff that he has already done. And why? Because it keeps him on the throne of our lives. Now, there are two principles found in Scripture of how we give. How do we do this? How do we keep God on the throne of our lives and live out this reality of give, save, live? The first one is in the New Testament. It says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, under guilt. God doesn't deal in guilt. 
for God loves a cheerful giver. The second one we see is in the Old Testament. It says bring the whole tithe, the tithe means 10% into the storehouse, that there will be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room enough for it. Now, let me give you a little background on this one. Um, There's 12 tribes of Israel. One tribe was um, the Levitical tribe. It was the priestly tribe. And all the other tribes would give to that tribe 10% of their first crops so that that Levitical tribe could take care of the spiritual and the physical needs of other tribes that were hurting or in a mess. So if one tribe had a bad uh, you know, harvest, then, then they could help that. And that's the principle behind this of giving the 10%. So so that the community of God could be taken care of. Now let me tell you Kelly and I's journey on this. So when we first started giving, it was back in our 20s. And I started giving not with a cheerful heart. I gave with a bad attitude. I did. I'm just be honest with you. And I gave, and here's why. I grew up in very humble means. And I was thinking to myself, here I am, I'm doing the work of God. I'm a youth pastor. I'm making no money. I think... God, you need to give to me. Why should I be given? And so I had a bad attitude. But something in me, or next to me, which was my wife, convinced me <laughs> that it was a good thing that we did this. So we started on an agreed amount that we would give every month. And so we started to do it. And so what's interesting is that even with a bad attitude, I was able to see the faithfulness of God in my life. I can remember about 25 years old, um, Taylor was born. She was like a year old, and we were living on one income, and I was making nothing. And so we just got paid, put gas in the vehicles, uh, got food in the house, and then uh, we paid the mortgage. But uh, because of everything landed on a certain date, there were several bills that were coming up that were going to be late or had to figure out what we're going to do. So we didn't know what to do. So the temptation is there, oh, I'm not going to give, not give. No, no, we, get, we did it anyway because... God bless Kelly and her faith gift. And so, a couple days later, a guy comes to me in the church. And he says, hey, Scott, I got a job. He's a construction guy um, helping build a school out here. And um, it's prevailing wage. And I need some gophers. Would you want to be work work on your day off? And, you know, I'll pay you prevailing wage to do that. And I got no business being in the construction world. (laughs) But I can lift and shovel and do all that stuff, and that's what I did. And it was amazing as I look back that God gave me a job on my days off that actually paid more hourly than the job that I had, and all my bills are paid. Now, was it hard? Yeah, it was difficult. But God came through. He honored the right order. Let me give you another example. A little bit later on in our life, Kelly and I made a mistake on our taxes because of being a pastor, you're self-employed, so you have to make sure that you pay your own taxes. Uh, they don't come out like a W-2. So we had to make sure that we were paying our quarterly taxes, and we missed the, the right amount. So at the end of the year, we owed $800, and $800 could have been $80,000 to us. 80, we didn't have no money like that. So I'm kid you not, we didn't know what to do. We are going to file an extension and make payments, the whole thing. We're trying to figure that out. So during this time, when we're trying to figure that out, um, this guy from Myers Molding, if you, if you uh, look this up and Google it, it's in Modesto still. It's a company, the Myers Molding. He went to our church, and it was, the company was struggling. As a matter of fact, it, it was about to go bankrupt. And so what he did, the owner who went to our church, he said, hey, would a couple of you guys come to my uh, company, my molding company, to my factory, and let's just pray. Let's just pray that God does something here. So we went. Uh, to his, his factory with all the machinery that cuts molding and all that stuff. And for those of you who know the practice of anointing oil, we took anointing oil and we went up to the blades on a machine and we laid the, the oil on the machine and we prayed, oh God, make this blade, just put it to work, God. Let there be wood going through it. And we prayed for about an hour to do all those things, just that the ble- uh, business would be blessed. About two weeks later, he lands a major contract He sends me a check for $800 in the mail just because he felt like God told him to do that. He had no idea what our situation was. Now, I know some of you are skeptical, and I know I'm just showing, I'm just trying to share with you the faithfulness of God. Has it always been easy? No, it's been difficult at times. Have we had to adjust our lifestyle? Many times we've had to do that. But here's the thing I want you to understand when you get the order right, God is always faithful, and He will be faithful to you. And this is the amazing thing that as I've grown now, Kelly and I work towards that 10% and even above that. 
And what we've seen in our lives is the more generous we get with God, the more generous God becomes with us. And I'm not just talking about financially. It's all kinds of different things that God works in your life, whether it's joy or contentment or peace. It's all those things are added. The blessings are amazing as you're more faithful with God. And we work towards that and strive towards that. And we've had to make sacrifices for it. But it's getting the order right, and this is why, so that money is dethroned as God in my life and God sits in the throne of my life. So, I think about what's going on here. And I look at my church and I go, what an incredibly generous church we have. And God is blessing the faithfulness of everybody. I want you to think about this. That every time that you give, you give to a multiple of things that are going on to roll back darkness in our community. Do you know that every time that you get the order right, set God right, and let's say you give to Green Valley Church, You're a part of reaching our kids, our junior hires, our high schoolers with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every time that you give whatever amount that is, you're a part of our intern program that helps disciple kids and and helps them to find out who they are in God. You've seen them running the cameras today. You're a part of that. Every time you give, you support big Wednesdays and Bible studies. You support every Bible that we give away. Every time that you give, you support the wood ministry that goes on to give people wood when they don't have enough money for electricity or their gas or whatever the case may be. Every time that you set God on the throne, you give so that we can give to missionaries and missions organizations overseas to help the gospel be spread there and help people in practical times of need. Every time you give, you're a part of the Saturday Cafe, which brings people food, shelter, a warm smile, a place to be prayed for, groceries that they can live on for a week. You get to be a part of that. This last week, one of the things that John told me, he was there, he did the devotional, and he said, um, one guy came up to him at the end of the devotional during the breakfast time, and he said, you know why the reason I come here? And Well, John was kind of like, well, I mean, you know, probably... you." You know, if you're in need of something, that, that you come here for that. And he goes, no, 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 I need all that stuff. But you know why I come here? I come here because of the dignity that you treat me with. He says, and not just me. He says, the other people too. I watch you guys. And you know what? We don't get treated like that anywhere else but here. You, every time you get the order right, every time you say, no, I'm going to give instead of withhold, you are a part of that. You get to be a part of that. You get to roll back darkness. And I got to tell you, man, it's just a joy to be a part of this church. And when I look around, man, I see a bunch of generous people who are doing some incredible stuff. And when I see that, I look into the future as well. And I think about, God, what are you going to do? Can I tell you some of the stuff that's been on my mind in the future? You want to hear about that? I, I don't have to say it. Yeah, you do. (laughs) I think about the what ifs. What if we could build a youth center right here on the property with free leagues for basketball, volleyball, and soccer for parents who can't afford the ASA or the AAU leagues or the rec leagues, kids that are, uh, you know, are not as privileged as other people, and just give them the tools on not only to enjoy the sport, but to play the sport and have coaches that share their testimony of what God has done for them. What if we could send a f- and fully fund missionaries who were developed right here at Green Valley all over the world to spread the good news of Jesus Christ? What if we could do that? What if we could build a chapel specific- specifically for our funeral ministry for people who have nowhere to go, no money for memorials to honor their loved ones the best way possible? Woo! What if we could staff and fund not only great online experience for weekend services, but a full-blown digital mission strategy where we could meet people online with podcasts and Bible studies and connections for those that maybe physically can't be present? What if we could fully staff an internship program where kids and young adults would come all over the United States here to learn about God, be discipled, and then be sent out to the churches of America to share their gifts with, with people? Here's the deal. The things that I think about, the what ifs, maybe that's the wrong question we should be asking. And the question should be, why not? Why can't we do all this? 
Why can't we? If all of us, we sit God on the throne of our lives and dethrone money, what joy, what mission, what incredible darkness we could roll back and say, in the name of God, we're coming because we put God on the throne of our lives. What do you think about that? So here's my prayer. My prayer is this, and I want to talk to a different bunch of people here today. First of all, if you're in a financial crisis and you're thinking, man, I want to give, but I can't, you're, it's okay. As a matter of fact, the Bible actually gives us principles on how to get out of debt. And we have some counselors here that work in financial peace that would help you do that. And, and that's, that should be your struggle right now, working through that issue. Don't, don't feel guilt or shame. You do that. Someday God will give you a chance to give. I, somebody always comes to me. There was a guy at, at two places, Blue Oaks and Ellensburg, came to me. He goes, hey, you know, I've never asked the church for help, you know, and they were using the food, uh, the food bank and stuff. I've never had to do that. And I said, well, you know what? Sometimes the storehouse is there for us to receive, and sometimes the storehouse is there for us to give. And if you're in a se season of receiving, God bless you. God's going to get you out of that season. Okay? If you're single, you're on a tight budget, just talk it over with God. Just say, hey, God, where should I start? And this is a true story, too. Back when I was here before, and I, didn't, I forgot to tell this at the last service, I, there was a guy who was, had massive credit card debt, and he wanted to do something. So he told me, he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start doing $1 a week, $1 a week, and then I'm going to try to double it every week. And about a year later, he comes back and he goes, Scott, you know what? I'm giving about 300 and some bucks every month to the church. Because God has been faithful to me. Those of you who have spouses that are not Christ followers, and just that's not their deal. Don't worry about it. Your first priority is to your spouse, period. Don't worry about this issue. God's not. Those of you who are blessed, man, continue to give, and let's see what God can do. So here's how I want to end. I want to end praying for you and thanking God for you, but I also want to pray for you that are struggling, your businesses and all that. I want to pray that God blesses. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the challenges of trying to keep us in the right place, Lord God, uh, and keep you in the right place. And so, Father, I just, first of all, want to say thank you to the generosity of Green Valley Church, Lord God. And, and I pray that you would just continue to bless and, and just share with the people who are giving of their resources, Lord God, to, to do what we do. And it's, it's humbling. Father, there's people here who's in financial situations that are really tough. And I pray that a couple of things. One is help them to find a strategy, some kind of strategy that will help them get out of debt. I pray in addition to that, that resources would come from unknown places they never expected. They would just come out of the blue. You, you've done it in my life. I know you do it in other people's lives. You'll do it in theirs too because you're always faithful, Lord God. God, I pray for those who have businesses here that have been impacted by high gasoline prices and high food prices, all this stuff. And they're trying to pay employees and they're trying to make all the ends meet and they're trying to sell their product, Lord God. It's a lot of stress. And Lord God, I just pray that as they honor you, you would bless them. You would bless them, Lord God. But more than anything else, never let us have anything else on the throne of our lives, but for you. Let us keep it all in order. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.